Oh no. Dead air. Dead air. Who's ready to worship? You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory. name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Against. 
Father, don't let us be a static church. Don't let us be content where we are, Father. I pray that your spirit would indwell this body, these people who love you and love each other. I pray that you would indwell us in such a way that more could happen than we could ask or think for the kingdom of God through this light that you establish in this body. Lord, we look to you for our strength. We look to you for salvation, not just for us, but for our families, for our neighbors, for our town. Lord, we ask that you would, um, that you would be so present this morning that we would see you so clearly that we can't help but love you and can't help but run hard after you. And we pray, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. No 
by her true name and that's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord and it's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips,
Ushers come forward. Be on my 
ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Father, we ask that you would take these tithes and offerings, that you would take from us what you have so freely given to us and that you would use these tithes and offerings to further your kingdom Lord I pray that you would use our lives to further your kingdom I pray that you would use Tim this morning to speak directly to our hearts Lord um, again you are welcome in this building I pray that you are worshipped here in spirit and in truth the way you foretold we ask these things in Jesus name amen and the children may be excused Good morning and welcome. Let's stay in this attitude of worship. Let's go to our God in prayer. Father, you are awesome and good. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, it's so good to enter your throne room this morning and get a fresh glimpse of who you are. Father, there is so much going on in our world. Our world is broken. But it's so good to have our hearts refreshed in you. So, Father, as your people, we come to you this morning and we do pray for the situations in Afghanistan. Lord, we pray for those in Haiti. We pray for those in Cuba. We think of South Africa. Just so many places, God, that are so broken. We pray for our own nation. We lift up our hearts to you, God. We pray for miracles in these areas. We know that there are members of this congregation that are right now actively deployed. Father, we pray that you cover our brave men and women in our military. God, but we are looking to you this morning to bring miracles. We pray for the church in Afghanistan, those faithful Christians who are in a dire situation. God, that you would miraculously give them protection, miraculously give them faith to endure. Father, we, we praise your great name, God, and we ask you in your kindness to be with them. Lord Jesus, be with us this morning as we open your word, that you would open it to us and that you would be our teacher that you would refresh us in your word this morning for your glory and by your grace. We thank you for these things and we pray them all in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. amen. God bless you. If you would stand up, we're gonna read God's word together this morning. This morning we are continuing our message series, Galatians, True versus Fake Christianity. And let's read what has been our theme passage for this series. Galatians chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. It's an honor to read God's word openly this morning, isn't it? To realize that there are many people in this world who don't have that freedom and privilege. So let's read God's word, Galatians 1, verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. Paul says, let them be eternally condemned. Let them go to hell. Wow. And all God's people said, Ouch, right? Can you say ouch this morning? God bless you. You may be seated. Paul, wow. Each week we've read that portion of scripture because that really sets the tone, if you will, for the entire book of Galatians. The book of Galatians, the apostle Paul, he comes out swinging. Why? Because the book of the Galatians 
is about false gospels subtly creeping into the church. But Paul, really? Let them be eternally condemned? That doesn't sound very nice. That doesn't sound very Christian. Uh, but notice this, Paul, he even includes himself. Verse eight, he says, but even if we, or an angel, or anybody, he says, even if I do this, let me go to hell. Is Paul simply losing his temper and throwing a tantrum? No, this is the book of Galatians letting us know how dangerous false gospels are. False gospels, if there really is just one way of salvation, if there really is just one way that you and I can be reconciled to a holy God, how tragic, how utterly tragic and devastating that there could be false teachers, false gospels that would lead people away from that one way of salvation. So the reason that Paul is so amped is because the consequences are so eternal. People could end up eternally separated from God. So this is not Paul throwing a tantrum. This is Paul showing us the heart of God. This is the only loving response. Imagine if you had an infant and you discovered someone was going around selling toxic baby formula. Think how you would respond. So Paul is passionate, but he's lovingly passionate. And this is such an important study for us because right now there are false gospels blowing through the church in America. They are subtle. How can we recognize them? What exactly is the true gospel? Well, that's what we've been looking at in the book of Galatians. So let's pick up right where we left off in our verse by verse, chapter by chapter study of the word of God. You'll remember last time if you were with, with us that Paul was showing us the true gospel compared to false gospels. He was showing us that there was really just one gospel throughout the entire Bible, from the very first page of Genesis all the way to the last page of Revelation, that there was really just one gospel ever preached. So let's pick it up in verse 15, right where we left off. Paul writes to Galatia, he says, brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, singular, meaning one person, who is Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Any questions on that? Okay, great, moving right along. All right, well, let's, let's break this down a little bit. Uh, he says that God gave Abraham a promise. It was in the form of a covenant. Let's start with this, who was Abraham? Right, the father of the Jewish nations. If you ask the Jews, he was like the quintessential Jew, the granddaddy of them all. He was their father. So we noticed last time that this is like Paul building a court case, this whole chapter. He's trying to show us what false gospels are compared to the true gospel. So he calls witnesses to the stand, and in this case he's calling Abraham to the witness stand, and that is such an awesome witness because Abraham, he, the quintessential Jew, so he's the expert. This would be like if we were looking for someone to testify about the development of the uh, incandescent light, and we called Thomas Edison to the witness stand, right? Great witness. He'd be your brightest witness. He's the expert, and here's why this is so powerful. Let, let's do this again, because I think this really helps. Could I have five or six volunteers? All right. Stay right there, William. My wife has to do these things, so uh, good. Yeah, good. We need a couple more. 
over this way? All right. You can stay there with them. Laura, why don't you stand right here? So if you weren't with us last time, this is really helpful. So this is a timeline of Jewish history. You can stand right there. This here is Abraham. Everybody give a Ooh. round of applause for Abraham. Here is our Moses, Charlton Heston, right, with the two. Pink tablets. Yeah, she's wearing the pink, but she's got two tablets of awesome law right here. And then you guys are the church in Galatia. And who gets to be Paul the, Pauline the Apostle? You get to be Paul? Okay. Paul, Pauline. So here's why this is so powerful. This is the church of Galatia, Jewish believers. And they're saying, Moses, awesome Moses gave us the law. The law, the law, the law. We are saved by the law. God gave us the law so we could earn heaven. So Paul points out to the Jewish believers, that's very interesting. <laughs> but, he, but he points out, like, did you forget somebody in our history? Because 400 years, 430 years before Moses, there was this quintessential Jew named Abraham. So if it takes the law to get us saved, are you saying that, are you saying that Abraham was not saved? Oh, shocking. He's pointing back to a promise given to Abraham. Stay right there for a second. Let's look at another verse together. Verse 17. Paul says, what I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later here does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. Paul saying to the church in Galatia, what, are you saying that God just throw, threw out his promise? Church, do you want a God who just throws out his promises? Just, no. no, right? You want a God who's faithful to his promise. So he's saying, th there was a promise given to the quintessential Jew way back here that nothing subjugates or negates all right, let's look at the rest of this. Let's thank our uh, volunteers. Very good job, Moses. Abraham, thank you. Pauline and the church, thank you. The law here does not negate the promise there. Verse 15. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. Covenant. Everyone say the word covenant. That's a formal contract, like a promise. Your, your car loan is a covenant. Your mortgage is a covenant. Try setting that aside for six months and see how the bank feels. You, sign, you made a promise and you signed your name to it. So this is letting us know that God gave Abraham a, a promise, a covenant. Paul is saying you can't just throw that away. And if you were with us last time, we looked at verses six through eight because they tell us a little, about, a little bit about God's covenant with Abraham. Look back at verse six in your Bibles. Paul said, consider Abraham, he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. Paul says God, he did something special with Abraham. Abraham did not have the law, but he did have something. What did he have? He had a promise, a covenant. He believed God, it says. He believed God. But notice what it says here. 
that God announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. What? Really? How did he do that? Notice what it says, the promises, the covenant, were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say into seeds, meaning many people, but into your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. Paul makes a big deal about this being to the seed, singular. Right, every letter in God's word is important. The missing S here, meaning that it's one individual descendant, is awesome and powerful. This is saying that this was speaking about a certain individual descendant. Spoiler alert, you know who this is talking about, Jesus. A certain seed. And that's a major theme throughout the whole Bible, this theme of a seed. The theme begins all the way back in the Garden of Eden. The, the promise begins on the very first pages of the Bible, the seed. Adam and Eve are given a promise from God about the seed. Adam and Eve sin, they fall. And such destruction, right? Just, just such consequential devastation because of sin, right? There, it, there seems to be no way back. There seems to be no way to undo the consequences of their sin. Just horrible. But then you look at chapter three of Genesis. Moments after the fall, God in his grace, even while the, the juice of the forbidden fruit is still on their lips, God begins speaking to them a promise about the seed. You can see it in Gen Genesis 3.15. God cursing Satan after the fall says this, and I, God, will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring, seed, and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now your translation might say the word offspring there, but it's the Hebrew word for seed, individual, singular. And notice what it says, he, singular, will crush your head, Satan. He, so God is speaking about one particular descendant of Eve, a male descendant, her seed, her seed, her seed, wait, this apparently is where God failed biology. Because all through history, people understand, well, it's not the woman who has the seed. Men are said to have the seed. Her seed? The Jews would scratch their heads over this through history. Like, well, what kind of biology is this? And then came Jesus Christ, a descendant of Eve. But one born of a virgin who did not have an earthly father. Could this be God on the very first pages of the Bible telling us that Jesus would be born of a virgin woman and would not have an earthly father, only an earthly mother? So the seed, one special offspring of Eve. And what does God say will happen between that seed and Satan? Some warfare. He says, Satan, you may strike his heel, but Jesus is going to crush your head. Now, at first, think about that promise. That doesn't sound particularly promising. It sounds like there is collateral damage. Both sides. Because imagine, imagine that. Casualties both sides, because it, just picture that, what it says there. Imagine stamping on a snake. And simultaneously, two things happen when you do that. 
that you have crushed that snake, you have given it a fatal blow. But at that very same moment, that snake has bitten your heel and injected its lethal poison into you. Sounds like casualty both sides. There were. Isn't that a powerful picture of the cross? That Jesus would absorb all of that poison. He would become all of the curse of Satan, all of the consequences of sin. He would become it all, but at that very same moment, he would be crushing the head of Satan. So he could say to every person here today, I absorbed all of it, all of your sin, all that you have ever done. I have absorbed all the guilt, all the pain, all the punishment. I've absorbed it all, everything Satan had on you. But I crushed his head too, so you could be forgiven and you could be free. Church, that's the message of the resurrected Christ today, that he has crushed his head and we are set free by his grace. What a beautiful picture of the cross. The seed. Right in Genesis, what a beautiful picture of God's grace. That just... Moments after the fall, when the juice of the forbidden fruit is still on their lips, God is speaking to them a promise about a special descendant of Eve who would make a way back, a way that they could be reconciled back to God. Verse 17. Paul says, what I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later, does not set aside the covenant, the promise previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. Circle the word covenant and promise in your Bible if you don't have that circled yet because that key word here, God's talking about this promise he gave to Abraham in the form of a covenant, one of the most spectacular promises in all the Bible. The Hebrew word in the Old Testament for covenant is the Hebrew word berit. Everyone say berit. berit. It means cutting. And literally, it's where we get the phrase from, cutting a deal. It goes all the way back to the time of Abraham because this is the way they did covenants back then. Serious covenants were enacted with a very solemn ceremony. You would take multiple animals, like a heifer, a lamb, a goat, and you would cut them in half. All right, gruesome. It was meant to be. You'll see why. Cut them in half. So just imagine that. This side of the sanctuary, you get to be the head of the cow. This side of the... No, let's not do that. Actually, yeah, they would cut them lengthwise. That makes it good, right? Okay, so you get to be one half of the cow, but then they'd put one half there, it was split here, and they would take the other half, the matching half, the mirror half, and put it over there. They would do that with each of these animals, gruesome, right? And it would make a bloody mess on the ground, but they would walk that path through those sectioned animals, it was called the blood path. This is part of a covenant. You thought uh, closing on a house was a hassle, right? Like this is like a major deal for a covenant. But here's what they would do. If I could ask my lovely assistant here. Holy. Holy. <laughs> so my wife and I, we want to get into a covenant. Actually, we did that already, didn't we? Right, we're in a covenant. So the two parties would lock arms and then walk the blood path. But there was something powerfully, potently symbolic as they did that. As they walked through those two sectioned animals, they would say, 
if I mess with our relationship, may that happen to me. What happened to these animals, let that happen to me. In fact, I've read covenants from the 8th century BC, and they literally say, that's, see that head there? That's not the head of a cow. That's the head of, and the person would state their name. That, that ram's head there, that's the head of Tim Barnes. If I mess with our relationship, that's what's going to happen to me. <laughs> yeah, right, she was uh, agreeing to that part. So there's different types of covenants. One would be where both parties are equal, not this one. There was a covenant where one party was so great that the other really could not offer anything except to say, if I mess with it, let me be sectioned. Let me be cursed. All right. So let's take a look. This is what happens with Abraham and God. Genesis 15. It says, So the Lord said to Abraham, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram, at this point his name is still Abram rather than Abraham, but it's the same guy, brought all these to God, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. So God says, hey Abram, I want to have a relationship with you. Go get me some animals. Let's do that covenant thing the way you in your culture would understand this. Bring me the animals. So there's Abram, right? All day long. Abraham is like sawing cows in half. Could you imagine that? Like how laborious that would be? Like he, but as he's doing that, he's thinking, wow, if I mess with this covenant, that's me, right? I'm hamburger meat, right? That's, that's powerful. A very moving scene is going on here. Sorry. Anyway, it is a very serious scene. It's like, wow, this is going to be really serious if I mess up with this. He gets everything ready. And then comes the time to walk the blood path. Genesis 15, verse 17. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch. All right. Got that? A smoking fire pot with a blazing torch. Sort of like two things. God shows up. I think it's God the Father, God the Son, sort of symbolically, but anyway. A smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. Oh, wait, where's Abraham? He fell asleep. The Bible tells us he falls asleep and only God shows up to walk the blood path. As if to say, Abraham, this covenant is going to be so special. None of the curses are going to fall on you that I'm providing something where the curses of the covenant will fall only on me. Abraham wakes up and he's like, wait, we're in covenant? Like, wait, ha what happened to the part where we're supposed to walk the blood path together? God, the way you did this, if I mess up on the covenant, the curses fall on you. How could that be? God says, Abraham, it's a promise. It's a covenant that our relationship is going to be based not on what you bring. It's going to be based on grace and what I bring to the covenant. Abraham, a day is coming when I am going to take the curses upon myself. Another famous passage with Abraham, 
Most of us are familiar with this one. In retrospect, it makes sense, but can you imagine Jews going through the Old Testament and then seeing the story of Abraham and Isaac? Like, what? God's asking for the sacrifice of his son? Genesis 22. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. And the two of them went on together. This is Abraham and his precious son Isaac. Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Father, where's the lamb? Abraham says in the Hebrew, literally, God will provide himself the lamb. That's what it literally says in the Hebrew. Wait, that's beautifully ambiguous. Does that mean God's gonna provide the lamb himself? Or does that mean God's gonna provide himself as the lamb? You can't tell in the Hebrew. Isn't that beautifully ambiguous? So Abraham is about to sacrifice his son and you know God stops him. Abraham, don't you dare do that. Because the time is coming when I will sacrifice my own son. But, but this picture, the, the son himself carrying the wood up a hill for his own sacrifice, willingly. The son carrying willingly the wood for his own sacrifice. What's beautiful, archaeologists are almost 100% certain now that the same hill that Abraham and Isaac walked up turned out to be the hill of Calvary where another loving father would put to death a beloved son. The son carrying the wood, a father in anguish watching the sacrifice that needed to be made. God would provide the lamb. Verse eight, it said what? Let's look at that again. It said that the God of this universe announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. I said this last time, but this is one of my favorite scenes in all of the Bible. If we can look at it again, John chapter eight, just because I love this so much. Jesus gets into this really heated debate with some religious leaders of his day. And Abraham comes up and they say to Jesus, are you Jesus greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? I love that because he's going to tell them. Jesus replied, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. Now listen to this. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to Jesus, and you have seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, right? Think, before Abraham is born, I am. They want to murder him right on the spot because they know what he's saying. He's saying, I am that I am. I am that I am God, right? This is not just bad grammar. This is wonderful theology. He's saying, I am that God, the I am God. The seed, the promised seed God, that's me. The 
The one who walked the blood path alone with Abraham, the I am, yeah, that's me. And the God who showed up in a burning bush over here and met with Moses, that I am God, that's who I am. And I am the one who will provide the lamb. That's me. And they understood the profundity of that claim. And they said, we're going to kill you right now, making claims like that, that you are the God of this universe. Abraham saw my day. It says, God announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. So Paul says to the Galatians here, just because the law came here, that does not mean that God threw out all the promise given to Abraham back here. So wait a second. The Galatians say, well, wait a second. We got a question. You can guess what it's going to be. Verse 19, what then was the purpose of the law? Why would God give it? We thought like God gave it so you could be good enough to get to heaven. We thought God gave us the law because that's how you like are supposed to earn your way to heaven. What then was the purpose of the law? Paul anticipates that question. He says it was added because of transgressions until the seed, note that capital S singular, to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. So he's saying the law of Moses, that's like two people walking through the blood path, right? They're both in trouble, or whoever breaks it's in trouble. He says, but no, we're talking about the one time God walked through alone. God is one. I think he's referring to that. But God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. The whole world is in big trouble because of sin. Anybody doubt that today? Right, just turn on the news. That's all of our problems, every one of us, individually and collectively. So that what was promised, what was covenanted, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. What a picture, like sin. Like I'm locked up in sin, like when, when can I be set free? It says we were locked up until Jesus came to set us free. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. Underline that in your Bibles. What does that say? The law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. Paul's saying, why did the law, why was the law? wasn't to get us to heaven. It was to show us our desperate need of a Savior, to show us the depravity. The law came to show us the extent of our problem. Because why? Because without the law, we could be thinking, yeah, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm doing pretty good. Pretty righteous. The law comes and says, yeah, you think? Someone compared it to driving. You thought you were driving fine, but then someone put up a sign that said 55. Right? You were always speeding. You just didn't realize how bad. I have driven with some of you. <laughs> yeah, let's not go there. Here's Paul's point. The law it didn't fix anything. It just showed us the extent of the problem. That the law is diagnostic, not therapeutic. It's, it's di the law is diagnostic, but not curative. It's like an x-ray machine. Like, it, 
it shows you something's wrong, but it doesn't really do anything to fix it. It's like your mirror in the morning. Like, oh my. Young people, trust me, it gets worse as you get older, right? <laughs> like, look in the mirror, I'm like, my face is dirt, like, where, I was in bed all night, how did my face get dirty? Like, how did I end up looking like this? Right, but you don't take the mirror and rub it on your face. It simply shows you the problem. Paul says, be careful of false gospels. He says, church in Galatia, what happened is false teachers came in and they began convincing you that what was given to show you your problem could fix your problem. You could fix your problem yourself. Don't take what God gave you to be diagnostic and claim it's therapeutic. Your problem's worse than you realize. And that we need a savior and his name is Jesus Christ. The law should show us how bad our driving is. That we have a bad disease. That our faces are dirty. So the law of Moses doesn't fix it. But it should make us desperate for the cure, right? Like the x-ray machine doesn't fix it, but we're like, whoa, that's a problem. Who's got the cure? The law tells us that we have offended a holy God. You remember last time Paul had us look at the cross? The, Paul, the, the cross tells, tells us that we have offended a holy God because of sin, and there's really only one cure. How beautiful, right? How wonderful Jesus is. What a savior. The incarnate God would do that. Right now there's a false gospel blowing through the church in America called universalism. It basically says that ultimately everybody gets saved. That in the end God would never send any person to hell. He's just too loving, would never do that. So no matter what, you'll ultimately be saved. That's a false gospel. So I said to a universalist that I was debating, I said, if everyone is automatically saved in the end anyway, then why are we sending missionaries to places where they'll end up getting killed for preaching the gospel? Our denomination has lost some really precious people. Why would we do that? Right now, the Taliban going door to door looking at people's phones in Afghanistan, and if you have a Bible app on your phone, Serious persecution, martyrdom, certainly, in most cases. Why would we do that? So when I asked this universalist about why would we be sending missionaries to dangerous places, like just keep them home, we all get saved anyway, this person said, well, I know that they're gonna, everybody's going to be saved anyway, but it really helps them enjoy life more when they understand the gospel. That's why we send missionaries to these people groups to tell them the gospel, because it helps them enjoy life more. I'm like, really? That's why we do this? That's why Paul was persecuted, shipwrecked multiple times, beaten with rods. That's why we do this? Imagine this scene, scenario one. There's a jetliner crossing the ocean, out in the middle of the ocean, the pilot calls one of the flight attendants into the cockpit and says, listen, this plane is leaking fuel. We are in the middle of the ocean. We have 20 minutes, 30 minutes tops, and we are going down. We can't make it back to land. We are going to end up in the ocean. And imagine the flight attendant going out, grabbing the intercom and saying, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. 
can I interest you in a parachute and an inflatable raft? Two, maybe at most three people will say, yeah, why should we take that? Because it would help you enjoy the flight more. Right, so after like five or 10 minutes, they're like sitting there with the parachute on, like it's bulky and taking up so much space. Like, you lied to me. You told me this is gonna help me enjoy the flight more. People are laughing at me, chuckling, whispering about me. This day, I'm getting angry. That's all I'm getting out of this parachute. All right, scenario two. The flight attendant grabs the intercom and says, listen up, everybody, right now. Drop whatever you're doing. This is a matter of life or death. Listen to me. Look at this plane is going down in 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes at the most, but we are ending up in the ocean. Now, does anyone want a parachute? An inflatable life raft, right? Everyone would take it. Forget the comfort. Who cares if you're uncomfortable sitting there with a parachute on? The law tells us that we have offended a holy God and that the only way back is Jesus Christ. We desperately need the cross. Any gospel that minimizes that is a false gospel. Let's finish up the passage. Verse 26, Paul writes, you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If, circle that word in your Bible. That's like the biggest two-letter word in the Bible, if. That doesn't sound like universalism to me. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Like he says, you have clothed yourselves with Christ. We get new clothes, hallelujah. We get a brand new identity in Jesus. That's the best type of identity theft right there, right? We get his righteousness. We get new clothes, it says. We have put on Christ. The gospel should affect the way we live. We are not saved by the way we live, but it should affect the way we live. We get a new identity in Christ. He goes, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Our culture could use some unity right now, don't you think? That should begin in the church. It says we are all one in Christ Jesus. Our country is like the most hyphenated country on the planet. It shouldn't be in the church. He says we are all one. Whatever categories would normally divide us. Right, race, whatever, black, brown, white, rich, poor, male, female. He says none of that matters in Jesus. Like that's the only category that matters. Are you in Jesus or not? That ultimately is the only categories that are ever gonna matter in human history. In church, we need to lean into the gospel of Christ and we need to lean into that truth of unity because I think the days are coming when we are gonna need each other more and more because, well, some of you are already facing challenges at work, risk of losing your job because of what's happening in our nation. We're gonna need to be there for one another. And we're, we're, as best we can, we're gonna need to be there for our brothers and sisters in different parts of the world. 
How exactly we do that for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan? The underground church leaders that were put on a list and told they will be executed within a few days. They said, just pray for us. That we won't flinch. We won't compromise. That we'll just go out with a bold testimony. So we can do that. We can also pray that God will do some type of miracle, right? That many of them will somehow miraculously be spared. Some have gotten out. Some said, we're not going because this is our mission field. That God so loved the world that he made Abraham a promise. That he provided a lamb, so we're staying. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love and kindness today. Your goodness is overwhelming to us. And your cross is such a gift. Father, let it affect the way we live, and yeah, let it affect the way we die. If that moment comes where we have to make a painful choice, Father, I'm praying for anybody who has listened to this message and they've not yet given their life to you. That they would really think about these things. And Lord, that they would know that if they're willing to turn from sin and turn to you as their Lord and Savior, that your arms are open wide. That you have provided the Lamb. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That this is the very reason you came. This is what the gospel is. This is what every page of this book pointed to. The great I am God became one of us and died to reconcile us back. But at that moment, he crushed the head of Satan. And he absorbed all the guilt, all the shame. And he gives us a new identity in him by grace. If that's you this morning, just pray about that. Just say, God, come into my life. I give my life to you. Church, let's stand and sing a final hymn of worship to our great God and Savior. you need prayer.
Leading us in worship with that song, but the altars are open, so don't carry a burden home with you today. The prayer ministers will be up here to meet you at the foot of the cross to pray with you, so please come forward. If you need to leave, you are dismissed. You may fellowship in the back, but these front rows are a holy place for those who need prayer and some more time with the Lord. God bless you. Ashes in for beauty, and wear forgiveness like a crown. Coming to kiss the feet of mercy, I lay every burden down. I lay.
worthless, but you're worth it. And he calls you his own, made in his image. You were made for more. You think there is no plan, that it's all by chance. But don't believe